So I welcome come all uh, the panelists to this first panel, uh, Energy Security Landscape from National and International Perspectives. And the goal of this panel is to look at the landscape for energy security in the region uh, in view of recent political and economic developments. And we had a lot of developments in the world uh, just recently. Uh, again today in, in Italy and, and in Austria, uh, two important decisions have been taken. And just recently, the, the reduction of, of oil production from, from the OECD, the agreement which impacts on energy prices now. So uh, yeah, the, the things evolve very rapidly. So I think this is exactly a perfect uh, panel to start the discussion. And um, <clears throat> yeah, I have uh, uh, three, four panelists with me. And um, I think we do it in a way that everybody starts uh, with a little outline, uh, presenting her or his views on, on the issue. But then we should make sure that we have uh, also some time for discussion and for questions. And I would like to encourage the audience to, to actively participate in the discussion and to, to, to ask questions and, and to engage in an exchange uh, rather than only in, in frontal speeches. So um, <clears throat> the first uh, presenter is uh, Mariam Walishvili, which I already uh, uh, welcomed all of you, uh, the Deputy Minister of Energy of Georgia, on the subject uh, Georgia's policy for regional energy cooperation and energy transit. So Minister, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair, once again. Um, uh, let me first uh, uh, recall what have been the very practical steps that Georgia made in terms of the policy um, uh, policy uh, uh, achievements. Uh, uh, very significant. Uh, uh, the step was signature of the Energy Community Accession Protocol, which uh, practically defines the energy policy of Georgia for the coming um, for, for the coming years, uh, which ultimately calls for the uh, quite in-depth uh, reforms that needs to be performed, which ultimately is not the reforms that will be affecting the Georgia within its borders, but of course it definitely uh, impacts uh, the, some developments in the region as well, because we uh, do have the energy cooperation with our neighbors, and of course the, the rules of the game and the principles that we will, uh, we will try to integrate with our legal and regulatory framework, of course, need to be complementing to the energy cooperation um, activities that we have with our neighbors. Um, energy security, of course, is the high priority, uh, and why? Because we are quite vulnerable to the um, cooperation, energy cooperation in the region, as we heavily depend on the imported energy resources. Uh, this dependency definitely is uh, um, uh, may making Georgia to be exposed to the potential threats. It might be some geopolitical uh, challenges, it might be um, infrastructural challenges, because a lot of uh, uh, pipelines, a lot of transmission lines, a lot of critical uh, infrastructure exists in um, uh, in uh, the region, and of course, uh, starting from pipelines, nuclear, large dams, everything is here. Uh, so I think that uh, the common effort of uh, uh, proper operation uh, and protected uh, uh, critical infrastructure uh, is uh, very um, important. Uh, and from that perspective, I think uh, uh, the Georgia being vulnerable to all these threats, of course, will be very keen to be involved in all the programs, all the efforts which is happening in terms of protecting uh, energy security of the country and uh, the region itself. Um, one of the uh, challenges that uh, Georgia experiences today is the growing demand. Uh, if you monitor the statistics of demand growth in gas, uh, in electricity sectors, of course the uh, demand is growing. Uh, this is, uh, at one hand, uh, might be good because uh, economic activity is maybe uh, there and some, <clears throat> uh, 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 how, how to say the demand is growing, it ultimately means some activities in the economy. Uh, and uh, But it doesn't mean that uh, uh, somehow it decreases uh, our exposure to the threats that potentially might exist uh, 
in relation to Georgia. Uh, in, for example, in the electricity sector, 40% uh, of power production in our country is coming from Anguri, which particularly partly is, is located on the occupied territory. And of course, secure, secured operation of this critical infrastructure, I might call it, is uh, very crucial. On uh, top of that, there are uh, transit pipelines which are gaining more and more importance in the uh, gas life of Georgia, and particularly with the development of uh, um, uh, Shakhtin is phase two, and particularly on the territory of Georgia, we are quite well progressing with the construction works of uh, SCP expansion, the South Caucasus pipeline expansion, which then needs to be, uh, will be followed by TANAP uh, um, and um, TAP. Um, uh, to Italy, uh, but recent uh, developments, uh, I don't know how will be impacting uh, this um, South Gas Corridor development, but uh, I'm pretty sure that these developments at the very end does not hinder the sovereign interest and national interest of individual countries. This regarding whether somebody voted for the constitutional uh, changes or not voted. I think these are the very strong national interest and this will be maintained by any a government by any uh, power which will be coming uh, as the leaders of uh, different countries. So I think interest is much higher there for the cooperation rather than individual developments that might be taking place in different countries. Uh, the, which is, we, what is uh, very important is basically the strategic partnerships that we shaped already uh, for um, last decade uh, and which is the very sound basis for in, even enhancing this partnership further. Uh, here I'm talking about the partnership that we are having with Azerbaijan and Turkey and practically all uh, critical infrastructure, all transit pipelines, all transit infrastructure which exists uh, there and um, I think needs the common uh, approach and common interest to be paid to uh, this uh, safe operation of this infrastructure. Uh, I have to note that um, uh, we have quite expanded our cooperation in power sector because this is the very first year when we have started the transit from Azerbaijan to Turkey, the electricity transit of uh, um, quite in a large uh, quantities, which ultimately means that our cooperation in the energy sector is not limited only with hydrocarbons, but also beyond that. And we are pretty sure that with the developments of the clean energy projects in our country, we will have even further opportunities for enhancing cross-border exchanges with our neighbors. And as I said, uh, what is very important for all of us is to uh, put our cooperation uh, in a framework of the common interests, which I think is the practice for many years, and I'm very happy to uh, have the partners with us, but not uh, like an, uh, uh, enemies where we have to deal with. So I think uh, this is the advantage of us, which basically brings uh, um, us uh, to the next level, which is even more projects, even more ac active cooperation. Uh, and of course, uh, it serves the energy security needs of Georgia, I have to admit it, because with the uh, additional transit projects, with the uh, increased the scale of cross-border cooperation, and cross-border exchanges. Of course, Georgia gains uh, um, uh, security, even increases the quality of energy security in our country. And uh, uh, with uh, all these decisions, we are trying to make us less and less vulnerable to the uh, things that might be happening in the region. So solid cooperation, of course, is the precondition of well-being of Georgia in the next future. That's why we're trying to maintain our partnership in a very high level with our strategic partners. A uh, number of the critical infrastructure elements that Georgia is planning to um, develop, of course, this is the uh, underground gas storage uh, facility, which basically will be contributing to the quality of energy security in our country. Um, uh, definitely, it's very, very, very important element of um, uh, reliable gas supply to the, the domestically, but at the same time, this uh, facility can be of support of the transit operations um, in future. The second very important element, of course, of our policy priorities are the even further expansion of renewable capacity in our country, which ultimately uh, contributes to the domestic production and with that basically uh, co co contributes to the energy security and less dependency on the imported uh, energy uh, resources, but at the same time um, uh, contributing to the climate uh, uh, commitments, climate, uh, climate, uh, um, uh, climate commitments that we have uh, uh, declared uh, through signing the COP21 
declaration. And I think clean production, producing in the region, good partnership with our counterparts in the region, and developing different corridors. Uh, probably you are aware that we are working not only east-west, but also north-south corridors, the electricity power exchange corridors, which traditionally have been the cooperation platforms for different groups of the countries in the region. And of course, we don't want to isolate any of the countries, but at the same time, have very pragmatic policies energy co for co energy cooperation in the region. But of course, priorities are there, rankings are there, and the effort from our side is uh, delivered according to these priorities. So with that, I might be saying that, that I will be finishing with this introduction. And of course, if there will be the um, uh, questions from our distinguished audience, of course, we'll explore these issues further. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Minister. For, for a great overview of the situation and the efforts of your country in the field of, of energy security, you're doing a lot, you have achieved a lot. Uh, and uh, one key word I take away, cooperation, is, is, uh, is uh, the, the key to all of that. <clears throat> and this was said by others before. So I would like to give at the end of the session uh, the opportunity for questions and, and answers. But if there is any very pressing question now to the minister, I'd would like to offer you the opportunity for that. If not, we take questions at the end. And I move on to Bill uh, Silkworth, Director of Energy Diplomacy for Europe and Northern Africa for the Energy and Natural Resources Bureau, US Department of State. Please, Bill. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. And I first, of course, want to acknowledge uh, uh, Ambassador at Large uh, Mikaladze. Deputy Minister uh, Valashvili, Dr. Zidania, uh, His Excellency the Ambassador of Romania, Harumba, uh, Colonel Matulis, uh, and uh, the, Mr. Gall, thank you very much for chairing, and uh, World Experience for Georgia, fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and uh, I should mention Dr. Margas Marga Valashvili, of course, as well, for thanking him for uh, setting this up today. It's really a, a great pleasure to be here. Um, I think it's an important workshop. And uh, I think uh, what I've learned already in listening to the opening remarks and the marks of, remarks of uh, Deputy Minister Balashvili is that uh, there are many common themes here. And I think I will be reviewing some of the same things that people have mentioned. But I think what I'd, what I'd first like to do uh, first like to focus my remarks on the uh, global oil and gas markets, the context that provides, and then speak a little bit about the importance of energy sector diversification uh, with respect to uh, Europe and the Caucasus, of course. Uh, but my overall message is really the following, that energy sector diversification is the key to energy security and uh, energy security is important because it underpins political independence and economic security, and thus it really lies at the heart of a country's national security interests. Okay, so first to the, uh, the global energy uh, markets, global oil markets in particular. Just to look at prices, uh, since 2006, of course, there's been a fair amount of volatility, but uh, you know, Back uh, at the beginning there, you could purchase Brent for about $65, Brent oil. A couple of years later, price had gone up above $140. And then, uh, you know, now we've been down this average this year about $45, despite the fact that there have been some significant outages and lower production in places like Nigeria, Iraq, Libya, and Venezuela. Uh, now, I know the recent OPEC agreement uh, has had, um, you know, already raised prices. I think Brent was up, or up above $54 uh, when I checked on Friday. Uh, that's short term. Uh, but we also know that new supplies will uh, also affect uh, global oil prices. So looking at uh, global oil production, uh, you know, there's really been a story worldwide of, of just uh, significant increases. The United States has been, uh, of course, a dramatic example. It uh, produced 5 million barrels a day of crude back in 2006. Today, uh, producing about 8.7 million barrels a day, but 
even back in January before there was a decline, uh, U.S. production had re reached uh, 9.5 million barrels a day, and that's, that's really quite extraordinary because we hadn't seen production like that since the 1970s. And then other major producers, Russia, uh, followed a similar path, 2006, it was about at 9 million barrels a day of crude, and uh, now it's over 11 million barrels a day. Even the uh, Saudis, uh, although a long-time major producer, they were at about 9.5 million barrels a day, and they've been up uh, above 10, well over 10 million barrels a day for a while now. Uh, furthermore, despite a lot of dour predictions, uh, operators of uh, the, some of the shale oil plays in the United States have demonstrated an unexpected ability to maintain production, despite the fact that prices have, have fallen a little bit uh, over the last year. So the major, uh, the major shale oil uh, deposits in the United States you know, all have collectively a, a, like a, a huge uh, uh, quantity of recoverable reserves, 32 billion barrels. Uh, they remain economic even now at uh, when we've had prices even uh, under $40 a barrel. And uh, on, the, uh, on the demand side, you know, we've seen, uh, and, uh, and our Department of Energy's projections indicate that we expect global demand to grow a little more slowly. Uh, but, you know, there's still 1.3 million barrels a day, perhaps, in, in uh, 2017. And that's, that's the case there is that there's probably not going to be a lot of change in demand in the OECD countries. But uh, it'll be quite a bit of uh, the driver will be India, major driver of new growth. And then uh, uh, the global gas story is, uh, is a similar story to oil, but really it's uh, much more dramatic. Uh, the prices continue to re reflect these regional disparities, of course, but we're beginning to see the advent of you know, price convergences with uh, pipeline gas in some areas in the world coming into greater parity with uh, LNG. <coughs> and uh, greater competition among LNG suppliers and spot markets is also putting downward pressure on prices. So bottom line, as with crude oil, you've seen gas prices uh, trending lower. And on the production side, uh, over the last decade, global natural gas production has climbed about 20 percent, from uh, 3 trillion cubic meters a day, or a year, I should say, to 3.6 trillion cubic meters a year. Again, back to the United States story, uh, our, our natural gas production has grown from 525 BCM a year in 2006 up to about 765 BCM a year in uh, 2015. That's about a 46% increase. Well, actually, it's, it's not quite that. I've missed, but it is a significant increase. Uh, this growth story has uh, played out globally, not just the United States. Uh, between 2015 and uh, uh, between 2005 and 2015, we've seen substantial increases elsewhere, too, South America, Central America up 27 percent, uh, Turkmenistan 27 percent, Norway 37 percent, and more dramatically Iran up 88 percent, Nigeria 100 percent, uh, Qatar 296 percent, China also up about 170 percent, Australia 70 percent. So on uh, the demand side also, uh, Growth has really been the story there, too. Uh, our our uh, experts at U.S. Department of Energy see that global gas demand is going to grow from that, that 3.6 trillion cubic meters uh, that we, I mentioned for 2016 up to uh, 5.8 trillion cubic meters over the next 25 years. And that's, uh, that's over a 50 percent increase. But just to, to note, it's really the story with natural gas, is, it's not just a matter of, of growth. There's also been this unprecedented integration. 
and LNG is really responsible for this transformation. I think you've seen that a lot of uh, countries have recognized the security benefits of LNG, and uh, you know many countries have obtained the needed infrastructure in order to be able to participate in uh, global LNG markets. And uh, for example, in, in uh, the year 2000, there were uh, 12 countries that were able to export LNG. And uh, now we have 17 that have that capacity. And meanwhile, uh, even more dramatically on the import side, we had 11 countries that could import LNG in 2000. Today, there are 37. Uh, there's also, you know, the technology is also extended now with the uh, floating uh, storage regasification units, or FSRUs. They were really unknown back around 2000, but now there are uh, about two dozen FSRUs worldwide, and they're located in, uh, you know, about a dozen countries right now, and then others are, are actually ordering uh, FSRUs for their use. And I think uh, to take a page from uh, Deputy Minister Valashvili, I think the, you know, there are people that are recognizing that natural gas has benefits also as a greener, uh, greener source of energy security, uh, given that the carbon emissions are uh, associated with it are so much lower than uh, coal, actually, which is the, what's been uh, substituted out in many cases. So to, to summarize, in in uh, both global oil and gas markets. The last decade has really been uh, transformational. Uh, of course, since 2014, we've had production more than keeping pace with demand, so prices have fallen. Uh, in the years ahead, we see probably you know, relatively steady, if there's relatively steady but not explosive economic growth, we would anticipate that oil and gas prices perhaps rising at a moderate but not explosive rate. I uh, just want to shift focus now, as I mentioned, and discuss what these developments mean for the pursuit of energy security in uh, Europe and the Caucasus. Uh, we have many uh, meanings of energy security that I think we'll be addressing in the course of all the various panel discussions today, but in my talk, I want to talk about energy security as being a state's ability to rapidly offset a disruption in the supply of a critical energy input at a period of peak demand. So uh, I think you know, we would recognize that uh, it's not only the speed of response that's important for, for governments, uh, but access to alternative sources and also uh, the timing uh, of responding in terms of whatever the seasonal demand cycle is for the various fuels. Uh, I think it's, we all probably recognize too that if, if a government can't readily respond to any supply disruption, uh, you can have uh, political, economic, and uh, humanitarian consequences that can be rather serious. So when we look at the uh, pursuit of uh, energy security in Europe and, and Caucasus context, I think that we are at a pivotal moment. Uh, and I say pivotal because right now, policymakers facing a set of decisions that will make uh, Europe and the Caucasus either significantly more or significantly less energy secure for years or de if not decades to come. Uh, to put this moment in perspective, uh, just let's look at uh, some of the significant steps that governments in the region have taken in recent years. Uh, this is very difficult to see, but it, uh, it uh, well, I can speak to it without the, uh, without the slide, I think. But anyway, in uh, Ukraine, uh, before the Maidan revolution in 2014, of course, Ukraine relied overwhelmingly on uh, direct imports of gas from Russia to meet its domestic natural gas needs. But you know, today, only a few years later, uh, we see that Ukraine can meet most of its need by purchasing reverse flowed gas from Slovakia, Hungary, and Poland. 
Ukraine also has taken uh, very significant uh, steps to diversify its fuel mix. It, it's uh, National Renewable uh, Energy Action Plan, which it uh, uh, rolled out in 2014, uh, set a 2020 target whereby they want to <coughs> double from their 2009 uh, renewables, they want to double that percentage by 2020 to 11% of energy mix. This is an important initiative. Um, you know, other countries also are looking at boosting their renewable energy. Uh, meanwhile, uh, it's also a handful of European countries have really stepped into the global LNG market or they've expanded their ability to participate in that market and that has made them significantly more energy secure. Uh, I think Colonel Matulish uh, referenced, I think what is often the, the grand example, uh, Lithuania brought in a floating storage and regasification unit uh, back in operation early, uh, or late 2014, early uh, 2015, uh, and that I think had a, a fairly quick impact on the negotiated price with Gazprom. So. Uh, that was that was critical. Uh, Poland also has a new offshore LNG terminal at Świnoujście that it uh, took its first cargo of LNG in June. And then in this area, of course, uh, there's been significant project uh, progress in implementation of the Southern Gas Corridor. Uh, I think the construction on the first leg of the with the South Caucasus pipeline expansion, which began back in 2015. And my understanding is that by the end of this year, uh, it's expected there'll be more than 75% uh, uh, complete with that segment. And construction has begun on the uh, Trans-Anatolian pipeline, TANAP, and the Trans-Adriatic pipeline, TAP. Uh, so the Southern Gas Corridor was expected to bring substantial uh, new gas volumes from the Caspian to Turkey and Georgia uh, via Azerbaijan uh, by 2018, and then uh, to other points further west and north in Europe uh, by 2020-2021. Now, uh, in Georgia, I think despite the uh, geographic location that I think makes uh, gas supply diversification a bit difficult. Uh, there's still much that can be achieved. I think the Deputy Minister referenced some of Georgia's initiatives. Uh, and given the right market conditions, Azerbaijan can continue to expand its production capacity, making larger volumes available uh, for longer periods of time to Georgia, Turkey, and uh, points further on in, in Europe. Uh, Turkmenistan, of course, uh, could one day contribute volumes to the Southern Gas Corridor. And uh, we have to look at Turkey as well as a, as a transit state. Uh, it could further position itself as a major gas hub for uh, gas coming from the Middle East and from the Eastern Mediterranean. And that uh, also would uh, facilitate this, uh, both a north-south and east-west anchor for international gas trade. And uh, looking a little bit further west, Greece, Croatia uh, could add LNG import capacity and that would be beneficial for all of Europe. Uh, all these steps would really make uh, the region more energy secure, give Europe and the Caucasus uh, access to a greater number of potential suppliers competing with each other on the basis of price for market share. Russia's uh, efforts to dominate European Caucasus gas markets, however, uh, threatened to undermine some of the projects that we think would bring enduring competition to Europe's gas marketplace. Uh, America's, uh, our USA's support of um, energy uh, or uh, diversification in Europe and the Caucasus uh, isn't anti-Russian, though. I might, might want to emphasize that. It's really it's pro-competition. Uh, Russia certainly uh, could and should remain a key supplier of gas to Europe, but should be, you know, competing. Uh, I want to highlight a couple of projects that uh, the Obama administration uh, has been particularly concerned about. 
because they would not help energy security in this region, either you know, Europe more broadly or the Caucasus. Uh, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline uh, would maintain Europe's already significant reliance on Russian gas, diverting gas that currently transits Ukraine into a new pipeline, but one essentially traveling in the same corridor as the Nord Stream 1 pipeline. You would have about, I think, about 85% of, of Russia's current exports of gas to the European Union countries would be going essentially through one corridor. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would also, of course, we all recognize it would deprive Ukraine of these valuable transit revenues uh, at the very time that it's, it's trying to sustain its own reform momentum. Turkish Stream uh, would not help matters. Uh, you know, a single line of Turkish Stream would not uh, wouldn't really affect uh, Turkey's reliance on uh, Russia, but it would provide Russia an opportunity to uh, reduce the transit through uh, Ukraine. And then looking at Nord Stream 2 and Turkish Stream in combination, if, if both of them uh, were built, you know, they could completely uh, eliminate U Ukraine as a transit country for uh, Russian gas, and, and you know that would be between one and two billion dollars worth of transit revenues that would disappear. Um, and furthermore, really, with or without Nord Stream Two, if you have an expanded Turkish Stream, uh, the problem is this: this would very likely discourage other potential suppliers from competing for access to Turkey's pipeline network and thus for access to Europe's gas markets. So we would, you know, we'd see a blocking of the development of, a, of a, something that's really a critical regional diversification effort. So uh, again, uh, energy security really underpins economic security and political independence, and thus lies at the heart of countries' respective national security interests. Uh, of course, energy security is not free, it's not easy. Uh, diversification requires strategic thinking, forward-looking investment, and the political capital to build partnerships across national borders. And it, it also requires great persistence and determination because, and, and we know who some of these people are, these actors are, but there are many who see diversification as a threat. So it's important for those of us who recognize how important energy diversification is to energy security uh, that we combine our efforts and keep up this momentum towards a world that has more flexible, resilient, and secure energy systems. Thanks. I look forward to the rest of the discussion. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Bill, for, for a great and, and very impressive overview about uh, the situation in, in the different energy markets today, which is really, we see a change over the last years, which is good for the, for the consumers and for those who need energy. And, uh, but it's also the result of what you said, strategic thinking and, and forward planning, that we are where we are right now. Uh, like at the previous uh, session, any immediate question to, to Bill from the audience. I have one, one element, maybe you can just elaborate a little bit from my side. Um, I mean, describing where the oil price is now, 50, 55, even down to, to $40. Um, could you say a word about which countries have a problem with that? Because their own production price is much higher. You mentioned that shale gas, uh, shale oil, and so they had no problem, they continued. But others, like Russia, I think they have a, have a real problem with these low prices because their own production price is, is higher than, than what they can get on the market. Well, thanks. I, I think uh, it's really no secret. I, I think, as you know, that the countries that uh, are heavily dependent for revenues on their oil exports have been felt themselves hurt by the declining prices. But uh, I think that uh, uh, I, I don't know the uh, what the resources for shale oil are in all countries, and uh, of course the the challenge of um, 
uh, exploiting those. Of course, is also an economic issue, and with respect to Russia, there perhaps our uh, sanctions have had some impact on their ability to uh, deploy certain technologies. Um, you know, the key, uh, you know, many, you know, you look at Nigeria, Venezuela, clearly there are countries that have been hurt uh, very much by the low oil prices. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and one more question, please. Of, of shale oil and, and shale gas. And uh, can you make kind of assessment of what uh, effect on the world prices or availability of shale gas for, or of uh, LNG, for instance, or the pr effect on uh, oil prices it might have? And do you expect any uh, further export from, from, from that particular deposit? I understand it takes time, but still, what are the prospects? Thanks for the question. Uh, yes, I, I, mean, I think that, uh, of course, the U.S. Uh, is, the Department of Energy authorizes, of course, the exports of LNG coming from, including coming from shale gas. Uh, I think that, you know, the U.S., I think there'll be, I mean, more, the more oil that there, that is being produced in the world obviously has an impact on the, on the, world oil price. So I think we'll continue to see see growth in those areas. I think, you know, 32 billion barrels reserve out of the U.S. shale oil uh, uh, major deposits alone is very significant. And I think other countries, um, you know, I don't, I don't know all of them. Argentina, I know, is now looking at, at some of its reserves. There, I think it's a, a bright future for that. Obviously, there is always a price issue and, and uh, I think some of the decline over the last year okay has taken took some of the US shale oil production out but it's uh, again the, the story there was really how remarkable it was that uh, production continued at prices that were much lower than people anticipated so I think that um, most of the analysts that we talk to are for, for the longer term are pretty optimistic about that uh, about the their ability to exploit at even at the prices we've had recently. Thank you very much for the good question and then thanks for the, for the great answer. Yes, please, we have one more question here. Can we pass the microphone on? Ah, you, you have to. And please you. introduce yourself briefly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Liana. Georgia energy policy analyst. Uh, my question is about uh, sorry about uh, shale oil. Um, can we assume that this oil will mostly be competing with light oil like Brent, like Azerbaijani light, because uh, shale oil is light oil? And what part of the market it could take? Thank you. It's better. Okay. Thanks. I'm. Uh I'm probably not, I, I work in the energy diplomacy side, I don't want to apologize for that, but I'm, I'm not as uh, proficient in some of the, the different uh, grades of oil as some of my colleagues, but I, I, I just think that, you know, oil being such a global market, it's going to have an impact and, you know, that people will, of course, purchase heavier, lighter oil and blend it, uh, but, you know, it's having such a, a, a tied together global oil market, I, I think it will continue to have an impact, a positive one. Thank you very much. One more question, please. I'm Radu Horumba, I'm the ambassador of uh, Romania here in Belize. I would like to, to thank you, Mr. Silkworth, for the very impressive uh, presentation. As a former ambassador in Turkmenistan, I was happy to see that also this region was mentioned. My question is, say, it looks a little bit in the future. Uh, do you foresee a possibility in the coming years, I'm talking about 10, 15 years, of a total separation of the markets of crude from the market of uh, natural gas? It was a discussion and uh, apparently is going on on this matter because natural gas is becoming a commodity which is of much interest for different reasons and also because there is this uh, connection of price gas, natural gas price even most of us know are connected with the price of gas and which 
the price today does not reflect necessarily the utility and the economics of uh, natural gas in the future. And uh, secondly, about uh, shale gas, which clearly it's a game changer. Um, we see, let's say, expansion of uh, shale gas exploitation as a potential also for opening an additional op uh, competition for water, because you need water for fracking. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please. Well, I, I think to answer your second question first, I think, uh, you know, where, I, I think you're right. I mean, wherever water is uh, scarce, of course, that would have to be weighed in in terms of the merits of fracking and do, doing shale gas development. Uh, I'm sure, you know, many countries that are looking at shale gas, uh, you know, or have to weigh that in as a factor. Uh, on your first uh, comment about the, I guess, the oil and gas prices and whether there be a delinking. I think we're, we're already seeing that. I don't know how fast it would be the case that you would have a complete delinking. But even Russia uh, has uh, begun selling some spot, doing some spot sales of gas in Europe. And so obviously that, that in and of itself means that there's a delinking even with that, that very major producer uh, going on, so it, but it, it it will it will take time. But I think the because LNG is growing so fast now, I think it uh, will not take as long, perhaps as people might have said, you know, only five years ago, people might have thought, oh, it's going to be a much longer longer path. But uh, as I said, so many countries now are. Uh, building the infrastructure either to export LNG or to import it. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today, uh, and I would like to thank the organizers for uh, putting together such a very timely event, I think, uh, given the current uh, development and the very uh, uncertain and I would say unpredictable uh, markets, uh, emerging markets uh, that we are witnessing now. So in the wake of uh, all these uh, uh, geopolitical, financial and other uh, changes and uh, developments, uh, I would like to uh, talk about the uh, uh, Southern Gas Corridor and its impact on the particular European uh, gas markets. Um, so despite, uh, uh, despite this challenging uh, time, despite the uh, uh, low price environment and the turbulent uh, uh, market, uh, and um, it seems that the uh, Chardonnay Consortium will sell uh, the gas some uh, more up to uh, uh, 10 BCM of gas to the uh, European market and plus uh, 6 BCM to the Turkish market. Uh, despite that, I think the uh, gas producing and gas seller companies are enter, uh, entering quite a, uh, a challenging and unpredictable market. But I think the uh, good thing about all this is that all the contracts with the buyers uh, ha have been already signed, and uh, uh, these contracts are long-term contracts that are signed for uh, 25 years with the European uh, buyers, uh, nine European companies, and uh, for 15 years with the uh, Turkish Botash. And this creates uh, a quite a predictable margin for uh, for the sales, for gas sales from the Chardonnay second uh, stage. So uh, uh, what I'm trying to say is that at least uh, for the uh, Chardonnay consortium, the market has been already secured for next, uh, I mean the European market, for next 25 years and the Turkish market for next 15 years. And uh, uh, this is amid, uh, as I said, this turbulent uh, market and these uh, uh, the developments in the market. Uh, uh, it's also unpredictable due to not only to the changes in the market, but also growing competition there. And competition is uh, not only uh, between the traditional suppliers versus uh, uh, new suppliers or potential suppliers, but also uh, gas price versus coal price, uh, gas versus renewable energy, uh, 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 some energy efficiency policies that, that currently the European 
policymakers uh, are um, taking, uh, and also uh, the uh, uh, changes in terms of supply demand dynamics and the pricing. Um, so uh, there are a lot of kind of speculation about the, uh, the Southern Gas Corridor and some 10 BCM of gas that will enter the European uh, gas market is not a game changer. And uh, these 10 BCM of uh, gas coming from uh, new sources uh, via the new alternative routes will not uh, contribute a lot to the European energy security because uh, just only because the fact that the volumes are too small. But I think we need to look not only at the European gas market as a whole, but uh, to the regional market and the to the country markets where this gas will flow. So uh, for, for the time, for the sales and gas sales and purchase mm -hmm. agreements were signed only with actually the uh, uh, gas uh, uh, buyer companies in two, in three countries. And the uh, uh, actual effect of this in total 10 BCM to these markets is enormous. So if you, if, if we look at the figures uh, that uh, actually, the share of Chardonnay's gas in the, for instance, in the Italian market, the share of uh, uh, the uh, biggest gas exporter to these countries, the one single uh, biggest gas exporter uh, to this country, which is Russian Gazprom, then the share of the Chardonnay's gas in this market is uh, 38%. And uh, in 2016, this year, the uh, uh, total gas exported volumes of uh, Gazprom to this market was uh, more than 21 BCM. So the share of uh, uh, Chardonnay's gas in the Greek market uh, of like imported uh, from imported Gazprom volumes uh, is uh, uh, 40 40 percent. So it's almost the half of the share of the Gazprom imports. And in Bulgaria, it's 36 percent. So I think this figure is quite high uh, to be, uh, uh, well, if not a game changer, but to can contribute significantly to energy security of these three countries and diversify the supply sources here. Uh, uh, it seems that the current low price environment uh, uh, worldwide, but also in the European market, is not a is not a, a great challenge for financing the uh, segments of the Southern Gas Corridor. The share of uh, the uh, funding share of uh, Azerbaijani side uh, in this uh, project is uh, more than 12 uh, billion dollar. Uh, of which uh, 5.6 billion has been already uh, invested by the uh, uh, state uh, state oil company, which is uh, in the in the form of uh, uh, bonds that uh, Southern Gas Corridor Company, which was created uh, in 2013 to consolidate, manage, and finance the funding share Azerbaijani funding share. So, uh, uh, so the, this uh, SGC company, they issued a bond to SOFAS uh, to, for the total amount of $2.5 billion. Uh, so this amount was uh, uh, invested by SOFAS State Oil Fund of Azerbaijan. The rest, $1.7 billion, was injected in the form of equity by the Ministry of uh, Energy of the uh, government of the uh, country and uh, the uh, one billion dollar was uh, play, was uh, invested as a result of uh, uh, placement of an uh, inaugural euro bond uh, uh, which is amounted one billion so this was amid this uh, challenging time the uh, international banking and the financial institutions in the US and uh, in Europe, mainly in the UK, they showed great interest to buy uh, these euro bonds that were uh, issued by the um, uh, Southern Gas Corridor Company. And in March uh, this, this year, uh, there was a quite uh, successful inaugural of uh, uh, this uh, placement of the euro bond, and uh, the company succeeded to sell the bonds for the amount of one billion. And uh, uh, it's planned to be continued uh, uh, of selling this euro bond next year as well. Actually, this will be uh, taking place by um, uh, 2019, and the total amount that needs to be uh, raised uh, by 2019 is um, uh, five billion dollar. Um, 
uh, you know, the uh, Chardonnay's uh, field uh, is not the only uh, uh, gas field in Azerbaijan, in the Azerbaijani sector of the Caspian. It's the biggest uh, uh, upstream project in the, in the, in the sea, but uh, there are a number of other, uh, in compare with the Chardonnay's field, other smaller uh, fields, fields in the country which are currently on the different stage of uh, 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 exploration, appraisal, and development. Uh, of course, it's a, it's a quite challenging time to uh, uh, go ahead with the you know, uh, development of these fields uh, to find the investors or uh, you know, uh, to uh, uh, ensure the marketing arrangement for the gas, uh, potential gas that uh, can be produced from this field. But, uh, 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 with some of uh, those fields, it is quite successful. Uh, for instance, uh, the Absheron field uh, is now planned uh, to be to come online. The ramp up, ramp up volume, which is around 1.2 or 1.5 BCM, is planned now to be to come online in 2019 I I instead of 2020, late 2020 or 2021. That was uh, planned uh, previously. So these uh, ramp up volumes from Absheron field will go to the domestic market and. The a plateau level uh, of production, which is expected to be reached uh, by early 2022, is planned to uh, be uh, part, partly be uh, marketed in the domestic market and partly be exported. Uh, another uh, potential like contenders to be explored and uh, developed in the country is uh, the. Um, uh, ACG Deployer Gas and uh, uh, Umut Babek field. So uh, these two fields can add uh, uh, additional uh, uh, around 10, 12 BCM of gas. So in total, by by the end of 2020s or in the 30s, uh, uh, the additional gas production in the country could reach uh, some 15 BCM, and this can add to the total gas production in the country. Uh, which can uh, bring it to uh, 40, 45 BCM. But of course, ramp up of these uh, fields uh, depend on uh, many factors, and one of them is the availability of drilling creeks, marketing arrangement, finding a suitable market for this additional uh, free uncontracted volumes of gas, and uh, securing uh, gas sales contracts, which it seems to be not easy uh, at the moment. So the domestic market uh, in the country uh, the, the, uh, of Azerbaijan is not going to, the demand in the market is not going to grow significantly. So uh, uh, overall gas demand grows uh, by 2025 is uh, forecasted to reach uh, around 13.5 uh, BCM from current 10.9 uh, BCM. Uh, and uh, the SOCAR gas intense uh, you know, uh, industries uh, uh, projects such as uh, carbamide plant, the polyethylene plant, OGPC, uh, and modernization of uh, the refinery plant, uh, we think that will be, will be uh, developed beyond 2025, uh, given this uh, current uh, low price environment. And uh, country is 92% uh, is gasified, so we are not expecting uh, significant growth in, uh, in the household sector. Uh, the gas, the uh, uncontracted gas that uh, uh, will be uh, uh, produced in the country in uh, in long term perspective uh, could go to two main uh, and the I think the most uh, commercial viable markets, which are the Turkish and the European markets. But Turkish markets, due to its uh, geographic proximity, demand growth, and uh, uh, suitable price in compare with the European market, seems to be the most uh, viable market for gas uh, coming from Azerbaijan. Uh, uh, the Turkish market is also changing quite rapidly. Um, there are some challenges in these countries as well, and those challenges are un unpredictability and uncertainties. Uh, and those uh, challenges and uh, uncertainties is due to the uh, expiration of almost all the long-term contracts of uh, Botash and uh, some private companies with its uh, 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 suppliers and uh, other challenges are uh, actual technical challenges, uh, which is. Uh, a botash gas transmission systems constraint, and also the legal challenges, uh, which is derived from the uh, natural gas market law 24-24, which prohibits the uh, uh, 
uh, for Botash to extend its contract with the existing uh, suppliers and prohibits also the private companies to have the con to, to conclude the contracts with the uh, uh, companies from the countries where Botash is importing its gas. So whether the uh, uh, gas contract extension with Chardonnay's uh, one will uh, will will uh, materialize or not? It's I think on the question, and this is because of the availability of gas. I mean, uh, uh, um, so uh, the by by the 2024 or 25, the Chardonnay's uh, phase one uh, will pass its uh, peak production, and uh, the question is. Um, whether there will be enough gas to extend uh, the uh, uh, current uh, contract uh, after 2021. Uh, uh, extension with uh, Gazprom uh, uh, most likely will take place because both sides are interested in that. Gazprom from financial uh, 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 in perspectives and the Botash obviously from a security supply perspective. Uh, so uh, uh, we think that after 2025, the uh, 16 BCM of gas that will be expired uh, will be extended. And the contract with Iran probably also will be extended, but this is subject to a price agreement uh, between two sides. Uh, LNG, uh, LNG is not, uh, it seems that it's not a uh, solution for, is practical solution for the Turkish market in case if there is any uh, shortage of gas which can um, uh, um, uh, arise from the, uh, from the uh, 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 expiration of the contracts or in case if the contracts um, are not renewed. And this is because the uh, uh, regasification facilities capacity is constrained. And also, as I said, the Botash gas system entry points daily sent out capacity uh, is uh, quite constrained and is not able to accept more volumes of gas at these uh, entry, entry points to the, to the country. So this needs to be uh, expanded further with the compressor stations. Uh, the EU market, uh, uh, well, is uh, despite that d demand is going down, uh, uh, and uh, well, at least is this stagnant in some countries or going down in another countries. Um, uh, uh, the European market will need the uh, gas uh, from new sources, the new gas coming from uh, new uh, routes uh, to substitute, uh, first of all, the production loss, which is uh, um, forecasted to be around uh, 110 BCM by 2025. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, because of the expiration of the uh, current uh, long-term contracts, mainly with Gazprom. So uh, as you see in this graph, uh, the, uh, uh, this is the uh, result of the expiration of the contracts that the European gas suppliers have with its traditional uh, gas suppliers. And even if the uh, contracts will be renewed, the, the still there, there will be some uh, additional import niche for the gas coming from new sources. So the European market uh, will uh, will need to import gas, additional volumes of gas uh, from the new sources. And whether this will be LNG or pipe gas coming from Azerbaijan or other potential suppliers, uh, this this will decide probably the price. So price here will be decisive factor for the gas uh, uh, importing uh, comp uh, countries and the gas uh, buy buying companies to decide um, uh, their, on their preferences. And a few concluding uh, remarks. Well, uh, uh, amid this turbulent market, it seems that the, for the Chardonnay's uh, gas uh, uh, seller companies, the market is uh, secured for the next uh, 25 years and for the Turkey 15 years. Uh, and uh, because the final investment decision for the uh, Chardonnay second phase had been already uh, made, then uh, this project is currently in an advantaged uh, position um, um, uh, in compare with other such potential projects. Uh, 
uh, it seems that the financing of the uh, this multi-billion, like 40 billion uh, verse the project is not an issue at the moment because uh, uh, that was uh, there is a great interest of financial banking, uh, the fina international banking and financial institution to this project, and it seems that it's not a big issue to get the long-term loans to finance the segments uh, of these projects. And the European market is developing in a way that uh, uh, we see that there is uh, quite a good niche for gas coming from alternative sources, uh, from new sources for long-term perspective. And despite this unpredictable and uh, challenges, challenging market, I think um, and Europe will continue importing uh, gas uh, from, um, uh, from new sources. So I stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kamira, for, for a great presentation and uh, uh, outlining the potential of, of Azerbaijan and the relevance uh, in diversification and in covering our energy need. And as a, as a previous, uh, after the previous presentations, I would like to give the floor for, for questions. Uh, please, sir, and introduce yourself and please pass on the micro to the gentleman. Um, and um, it was... Uh, very good to hear that you look into the future as well. And I fully agree there is a niche, a very serious niche for Caspian gas for more supplies. And in this relation, uh, maybe we really need to emphasize that Southern Gas Corridor Group now acquired Germany. So this is absolutely game changer. Now, if Germany considers uh, the future imports to Southern Corridor, that's uh, a clear indication that the terminology which, which lately some people started to use Southern Gas Corridor in relation of TANAP and TAB is incorrect. In reality, Southern Gas Corridor is much more serious thing, much more strategic, and uh, for, for future it's probably to uh, better stick with this because that's also Commission now is trying to emphasize it. Southern Carriage Gas Corridor is a much, much more serious undertaking. In this relation, the interest, as you know, has been revived for Turkmen gas, again, for the Central European market. And if you agree, and I would like you to comment on this, it's also critically important for Azerbaijan to have a direct route to the Central Europe, where actually the market is, and not only be able to go through Turkey, which is more expensive, but also to have a direct route, which we used to uh, try to implement in uh, 10 years ago, starting, but now there is a situation when cross plexi pipeline can be implemented. Thank you. Thank you very much for this question. And uh, we had a number of questions for Golmira, so I would like to collect them because, I mean, we don't have to panic, but we are normally supposed to end at one, but we started 15 minutes later, so I think we can be flexible. But please, questions together, and then the floor to Golmira. So who is next? Uh, the gentleman has already the microphone, please. Uh, Thank you very much for your great presentation and all the data. I would love to have this data. Um, my question refers to Azerbaijani domestic gas policy. And uh, recent reports uh, saying that actually gas consumption is exceeding supply currently domestically. And due to the fact that most of the new gas supply is already contracted out, uh, Azerbaijan is facing shortages which could, be, uh, could explain also why uh, recent contracts have been struck with Gazprom on imports of gas into Azerbaijan. So my question is, would the relationship between Azerbaijan and Russia on domestic gas supply impact uh, SOCAR's decision making on Europe in the long term? Thank you very much. There was one more question here from the gentleman. You have already the microphone, please. Thank you. I'm Mikhail Henchar. I am from Ukraine. Thank you, Gulbira, for your, as usual, excellent presentation. Uh, two questions. One, additional to your Vashak Madze concerning Turkmenistan gas and Transcaspian gas pipeline. You did not include Turkmenistan dimension of gas supply to Europe. And as a question concerning uh, Azerbaijan LNG on Georgian Black Sea coast, a GRI project. What do you think about prospect of this uh, 
very ancient project. Thank you. Okay, another very good question. So, uh, yes, please, Guru Mira, you have the floor for answering three very good questions. Uh, I, yeah, first regarding the uh, potential gas flows from the Caspian to Germany. Well, you know, uh, I think uh, uh, one of the advantages of the TAP project that was selected uh, uh, back in 2013 is that uh, this project gives a lot of opportunity for um, for the gas sellers company to bring this gas uh, technically, uh, physically, to bring this gas to the neighboring countries of Italy as well, uh, all the way to uh, Switzerland, uh, you know, Austria, uh, even to Germany with the existing interconnectors between these countries because Italy is very well connected with its neighboring countries on the nose. And uh, 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 it's technically quite possible with a very small investment in uh, developing the uh, bidirectoral flows. Um, but the thing, but the question is the economics of such uh, transportations. I mean, uh, will it, the economics uh, allow to uh, take this gas uh, from the uh, Caspian all the way to the uh, remote markets such as uh, Germany or uh, you know the uh, UK or elsewhere? I mean, technically it's possible, yes. But I don't think that this would be cost effective to take gas to the, for instance, to the German market because the prices in the German market is quite low. It's lower than. Uh, elsewhere in Europe uh, uh, and uh, 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 the transportation fee will add to the cost of the uh, Chardonnay's gas in the market. So what is the point to go to Germany if we can sell for the higher price uh, to the Bulgarian, Greek or the Italian market uh, uh, and the destination is shorter with uh, less uh, lesser uh, investment. So I, at the moment, I don't see the uh, uh, rationale uh, behind uh, the gas transportations to the remote markets. And uh, uh, well, if in a long-term perspective the prices will recover, then this is something that uh, they could uh, uh, review it. Uh, the, was two questions about the Transcaspian pipeline. Well, I think the position of Azerbaijan is that, of course, Azerbaijan as a potential transit country would be very much interested in transporting uh, additional volumes of gas via this very costly infrastructure uh, uh, through Azerbaijani territory to all the way to the uh, Turkish or European market because the Sanzarin gas corridor is designed in a way that uh, it will be very uh, scalable project to transport uh, you know up to 50 percent more than uh, you know the for th that it's dedicated <coughs> for current volumes. Uh, 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 Turkmenistan possesses enormous uh, reserves of uh, gas reserves and uh, of course Azerbaijan as a transit country would want uh, and the companies that are uh, uh, in the uh, that are operating the midstream projects would uh, of course would be interested in increasing the uh, uh, commerciality of these projects but there are a lot of problems with the Transcaspian project and you know that 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 that, that problems are mainly uh, political or geopolitical uh, 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 and uh, uh, it's not Azerbaijan who can decide or push the parties to come to an agreement uh, I I think the interested parties should be the gas seller country, which is uh, Turkmenistan, or the gas buyer uh, countries, uh, which is the European countries. And this project probably needs more political backing from the uh, European Union or the maybe US. Uh, yeah, so uh, Azerbaijan is not the country who can uh, politically support the project. Um, but uh, this leads me to, an, to answer to, uh, to another question about the gas shortages in the country uh, and uh, the gas uh, purchase of Azerbaijan from Gazprom. Actually, we terminated the, um, uh, the agreement which was reached earlier between Sokar and uh, Gazprom to import uh, um, some, I think, uh, uh, 5 BCM of gas to the domestic market. Uh, well, instead, Azerbaijan uh, decided to import, and you may know it was in, uh, publicly announced that Azerbaijan uh, will import uh, Turkmen gas uh, through Iran. That will be a swap operation. So Iran will sell Turkmen gas to Sokar uh, through its territory, uh, but uh, and that's kind of a swap operation, and uh, uh, this, the, the uh, sales, uh, the, it was a kind of pilot project uh, which will be 
uh, continuing till March, and after the mar after uh, March, end of March, if everything will go smoothly, then Azerbaijan will uh, Sokar will conclude a long-term contract with uh, uh, with Iran to import this Turkmen gas. Uh, well, regarding the shortage of gas, actually. Uh, uh, that was due to the mainly technical reasons because uh, you know Sokar had an uh, unfortunate accident uh, in the it's one of its major platforms gas fields uh, plat platforms in Gunashvili field and uh, uh, that affected the gas production in the country uh, uh, quite significantly and uh, another reason is that uh, some uh, gas fields in the Sokar's gas production portfolio uh, past their uh, production peak because they are very aging, mature fields. You know, Azerbaijan is producing gas more than 200 years now. So most of those fields are very mature and aging, so that's why the production is declining. So the solution to this pro problem, as I think, is um, uh, drilling more wells, obviously, to increase the production. But for that, uh, obviously, the financing will be needed. So I think for in Sokar's uh, gas development program, this is this included in that program, and this issue is going to be solved in uh, quite a short or mid-term perspective by the drilling more wells and uh, by uh, uh, gas production from the Chardonnay's phase two and the Absheron field as well. So, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I oh, missed, sorry. <laughs> yeah, please go on. I missed one question about the agri project. I'm sorry. Uh, well, uh, you are right saying that that's a quite old project, old initiative actually, that uh, Azerbaijan, uh, Georgia, and Romania actually uh, initiated a uh, few years ago to transport uh, Azerbaijani gas in the form of LNG to the uh, uh, Black Sea port of uh, Georgia and further uh, uh, Romania. I think someone today will be speaking about this project, but uh, I'll just shortly mention that, well, LNG, as you know, as you understand, is the, I think, is the uh, uh, gas uh, transportation form of the future, because it's a very perspective uh, uh, form of the um, gas industry now, which is developing very rapidly. Uh, but uh, the, again, the question is about the cost effectiveness of the project uh, in the first place. And the second uh, uh, place is the uh, interest of the EU, whether the EU is interested in importing uh, this LNG from Azerbaijan uh, into its market, because the EU pri priority uh, in the, its uh, gas uh, security objectives is to import gas from uh, uh, new sources coming via new routes. Well, they think that probably the decision makers in the EU think that uh, agri project is not a kind of a diversification because the gas will come from the same source from Azerbaijan uh, to the almost the same markets. So that's why they, 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 they review it as, a, as a, not a diversification, but uh, gas coming from the same source. Uh, although the route is uh, is uh, is a new, absolutely new route. Uh, well, uh, it's hard to agree with this because uh, yes, the gas will come from Azerbaijan, but the fields are different, not the from Chardonnay or uh, the same fields. So, um, well, that's why it remains to be seen how the EU, whether EU will include this project to the project of common interest and facilitate the development of this project. Thank you, Thank you very much for an excellent question. We have to go on. So one last question for Gulmira, but then we move on. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Gulmira. Uh, my question is about um, this double swap arrangement between Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, and Iran. Do you think uh, what is the capacity, current capacity of Iran, Azerbaijan pipeline, and do you think that? This arrangement, swap arrangement, could set a precedent for uh, accommodating larger volumes of Turkmen gas, not through Transcaspian, which is quite problematic, but through Iran as a Bajani pipeline network. Thank you. Thank you very much. And a short answer. Uh, yeah, the capacity of the pipeline between Iran and Azerbaijan, uh, if I'm, I'm not mistaken, is around 5 BCM. But this needs uh, to be expanded in the event of uh, necessity. So currently the works, I think, have been completed already to develop the uh, bidirectoral flows, the reverse flows. Uh, uh, it's been done. 
um, with regard to the larger volumes, well, again, it will depend on the availability of the infrastructure because uh, uh, the capacity between uh, in the pipeline between Azerbaijan and Iran is not the, the only issue. And another issue is uh, the capacity in the pipelines between Turkmenistan and Iran, which is also, I think, is constrained. So these capacities needs to be expanded. Uh, well, uh, this is something also uh, they involve, I think, uh, some geopolitical interest as well, uh, because the, the European uh, Union is interested to buying Turkmen gas through the uh, uh, kind of dedicated standalone pipeline, which is the Transcaspian, uh, and whether it's possible to import uh, gas uh, from Turkmenistan through Iran, well, uh, that, that uh, I think, uh, not an easy question because, again, as I said, it, it involves some uh, geopolitical uh, interest of uh, the countries which will Im import this gas. So that's why it remains to be seen how this will be developed. Thank you very much again. So uh, excellent presentation, most interesting questions and, and great answers. Thanks a lot, uh, Gurmira, for your contribution. So just on the, the, the planning, I think the, the goal should be to conclude at 1.15. Uh, I propose to the organizers, I don't see it on the agenda, that after we conclude, we go for a family photo. And uh, photographers should be ready and then move to lunch. Yeah? Uh, so uh, let's move on. And I'm glad to have uh, Dr. Arunas Molis, a professor at the uh, Vitautas Magnus University in Lithuania, which strongly supports uh, energy security at NATO since, since a long time, and in particular, uh, when it comes to uh, this, this workshop. And uh, the title of your presentation is Escaping Insecurity with Regional Cooperation. Sure. Please, Thank you, you have the much. floor. Thank you very much. So, uh, well, it's really nice to have an opportunity today to present you a few things uh, on the Baltic States experience. And as I understand, I'm, um, the, single, the single obstacle between you and the land, so I'll try to be quite short, actually, and just to deliver you several, uh, several messages I have. So the Baltic states, um, why you should know the Baltic states? Um, most probably for the, for the last decade, the Baltic states were the synonymous of uh, very key energy problems, uh, be it the European Union or be it the larger context. We had a lot of uh, challenges with regards to uh, the diversification, with regards to the uh, interconnections uh, and, and uh, the prices and things like that. But at the same time, actually, uh, for the last few years, the Baltic states uh, I, I named uh, well, uh, as the cases of certain success, and, and uh, as the European Union uh, uh, stresses that the year of 2016 is the year of delivery for us, the year of delivery was uh, even earlier. For, for us, the year of delivery was 2015, when we uh, finished uh, quite a few uh, key energy infrastructure development projects in the electricity sector and uh, also in the natural gas sector. Uh, we finally uh, acquired the infrastructure for the natural gas imports, uh, which allowed us to uh, import uh, additional volumes of the natural gas from, uh, uh, from very different sources. And today we uh, import the natural gas from uh, Norway, and it's not only for the state company which does it, but also the private companies use the LNG terminal for this purpose. We also have interconnections in the electricity sector with Sweden and, uh, and, and Poland, which also uh, allows us to diversify the electricity trade. So all in all, all in all, uh, quite a few things were achieved. And, and uh, there is a question basically uh, how we did it. And, and, and here I have the key, key answer that uh, our, our key to success was uh, regionalization of our projects. Uh, we made projects uh, of the key importance for us uh, to be the regional ones. We didn't tell at uh, any occasion that uh, the LNG terminal or interconnections are for Lithuanian purpose. We did it from the very beginning that this is for the Baltic states and the Nordic states purpose. This is one thing. And the second thing was that we managed to involve such institutions as the European Commission is. And, and uh, well, as uh, I tell that the year of success, the year of deliver delivery for us was uh, 2015, but uh, the story started much earlier. And then we announced these projects to be our priorities, well, maybe 15 or 20 years ago. So everyone knew actually what to do, but there was a question of how to implement these projects. And the success came uh, in the year of 2008, 2009, when 
finally together with uh, other eight countries and the European Commission, we uh, prepared and delivered such a thing as BEMIP, Baltic Energy Market Interconnection Plan. So uh, my message of today is uh, as uh, after the lunch and for tomorrow, we will discuss uh, the NATO's energy policy and the NATO's involvement into the energy security. I tell that something similar, what we did together regionally involving the European Co Commission and preparing the Baltic Energy Market Interconnection Plan, maybe something similar we can do uh, uh, in uh, other regions, so first of all, maybe that's an example for the um, Black Sea region countries, for the South Caucasian countries, but also shifting the same kind of experience from the EU towards, towards NATO. So maybe a few things, if we go a little bit more into the details, uh, the very general overview of the situation we had, just imagine that uh, my words are not just the empty words. Uh, well, the natural gas, the natural gas, as I told actually, uh, we had a situation when 100% of the natural gas was uh, imported from a single supplier, which was uh, Gazprom. Well, uh, this year uh, we already imported around uh, 60 or 70% of the natural gas from different sources. So this shift basically happened just in a few years. Just in a few years uh, we managed to uh, not to even prolong the contract with the key suppliers. So uh, basically Lithuania as a country doesn't have any kind of contract with uh, gas from uh, any kind of a long-term contract with gas from. It doesn't mean that we don't import gas. We do, but we don't have a long-term contract anymore. Um, but uh, the problems are still not uh, solved. So I call the situation in the energy sector and the more so in the gas sector being uh, not kind of a uh, sprint. It's kind of a marathon for us. We have the import possibility now we have to use the infrastructure we constructed because it's also a challenge. It costs actually, so it has to be employed. It has to work, which means that imported, has, imported gas has to be competitive in terms of price, in terms of other conditions. So it's still, uh, there is a lot of things to do even in the gas sector. Uh, when we go to the electricity sector, so the situation is much more complicated. Yes, uh, well, you see the map of the Baltic states, uh, the map of Europe, basically, and the Baltic states in it. So in the very first picture, uh, on the left, the Baltic states are still in gray and then basically are still assigned to the system of a former Soviet Union. So this is the last, uh, the last legacy of the Soviet times, uh, where still operating in the so-called UPS-IPS system, meaning actually that we are synchronized the system which is uh, controlled, which is supervised from Moscow even after 26 years of, of, of our independence. So there are some key challenges uh, in the electricity sector which, uh, which remained. Uh, when we go to other, other problems, uh, other challenges for us, so we have such, such, such projects like the Nord Stream uh, which was already uh, mentioned today and which uh, also represents uh, a certain threat for the Baltic countries. Uh, in, in, in many terms. And then first of all, I would tell the environmental issues. Uh, secondly, uh, transit through Ukraine. Uh, the next thing, most probably, the military dimension of uh, this pipeline could, be, uh, could become the real challenge if, if uh, this pipeline will uh, become an object for the military exercises in the Baltic Sea by our eastern, eastern neighbors. Uh, we can continue actually, and, and uh, the challenges of the political nature also involve the nuclear power plant, which is being built uh, very close to, to the capital of the country. So, uh, 30 kilometers from Vilnius, uh, the nuclear power plant is being built, which we consider to be very much unsafe, which we consider uh, being built so not following the nuclear, nuclear uh, power plant standards, and uh, also creating uh, the unfair situation uh, in a uh, in the electricity market. We, we, we think that uh, with this uh, power plant, not only the real challenge to the security of the state rise, uh, but also potentially uh, the unfair uh, situation in the electricity market could be created. Uh, if we go to the practical things, so these are the photos taken just this year from uh, uh, the collapses from uh, certain uh, emergencies which are already happening at the nuclear power plant in Astrovitz. So uh, looking at this, we tell basically, and, and that was the last, the last case, uh, this kind of thing uh, falling for a certain high in, in Astrovet. So we tell basically that if this will uh, continue, so after this nuclear power plant is uh, fully, fully installed, uh, we, can, we can face uh, the real challenge of, uh, of something what uh, did happen in Chernobyl uh, more than 20 years ago. 
okay, uh, this is a full spectrum of the problems we have and so on and so forth. But uh, what I wanted to tell most probably is uh, more or less reflected in this slide. We have many challenges, but uh, if we go alone and if we only look uh, at the situation, at uh, the bad things which we have inside our country, the solution will not be uh, uh, up to us and then the solution will not happen. And then the Baltic states uh, realized it, uh, well, many years ago, but in the energy sector we had a uh, real uh, realization of this fact that the regional cooperation is needed um, more or less just in 2008 eight or seven when we started to work on the on the thing called uh, uh, on the thing called uh, BEMIP, Baltic Energy Market Interconnection Plan. So, so uh, I once uh, once again repeat that uh, involving the European Commission and uh, uh, building the plan which uh, uh, was understood uh, that this plan is owned by the Commission, involving the plan which uh, uh, was uh, adapted and acceptable for nine countries, which reflected basically the interest of nine countries around the Baltic, uh, around the Baltic Sea, uh, also allocating uh, very needed resources from the European Commission, uh, finally kicked off the projects uh, of which we are so proud today. Uh, well, uh, you see, basically, uh, in 2009, uh, that was uh, the head of European Commission, Barroso, which announced the BEMIP. So, so I, I still uh, come back to the very same issue that uh, today uh, we are able to talk already not about the diversification, but about the creation of the common regional gas market. We are able to talk not about the diversification of the electricity imports, but about the need to synchronize our system and so on and so forth, just because we had actually the plan, the plan which was endorsed by the Commission and which was agreed by nine countries. And I can, I can, I can really uh, tell with responsibility that if not uh, the role of the Commission and if uh, not the agreement uh, between uh, nine countries involving also such countries as Poland and German, Germany, which are also the part of the BEMIP, most probably we uh, we wouldn't have uh, these projects uh, around the Baltic Sea uh, being realized. Uh, NATO, after the lunch, we are shifting to the NATO issues, and then uh, here I also see a very similar situation which we had uh, more or less, uh, let's say, 10 years ago at the European Union. We know what uh, has to be done. We also know the competencies of NATO. One of uh, the tasks for NATO involvement in energy security is uh, more or less to take care about the protection of the critical energy infrastructure. So more or less it's, 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 it's fine. Uh, more or less the states and, and the NAC, North Atlantic Council, also recognizes that this is a very important uh, uh, task. And then we see the infrastructure which is built and now faces basically not only the physical challenges, but also the informational security challenges, the cyber challenges. And the question is, what can we do about it? And, and uh, we start even at the national level with a very simple question. Do we know the infrastructure which has to be protected? Do we have simply the list of infrastructure which has to be protected? So basically, even on a national basis, we don't have such a thing. Maybe there is something very secret somewhere at the NATO corridors. I may not know. But, uh, but, but uh, the essence is that, well, uh, we don't know what kind of infrastructure is of a strategic importance even on the national basis. So how we can expect the, uh, cooperation and uh, a wider involvement in protection of this kind of infrastructure. And as the infrastructure is increasing in numbers, so most probably sooner or later, this will become not only a theoretical problem for us. So uh, really, once again, the regionalization of the problems, uh, internationalization of the problems, involvement of such institutions as the European Commission, uh, NATO uh, as a whole, uh, and also involvement of uh, such countries, uh, the big countries like uh, Germany or Poland in our case, was uh, our key to success. So I think that something similar can be also uh, applied in other regions and uh, in other cases. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aronas, for, for excellent presentation. And indeed, in, in the Baltics, there has happened so much over, over the last years. And you can really give a very good example how to, to uh, increase energy security. I don't want to encourage too much questions <laughs> because we are a little bit uh, behind the agenda.
<laughs> but if there is a very urgent one, I would take it. I take max two. So, okay, so who was first? The one who has the microphone is first. So here in the front. Thank you for your excellent presentation. Uh, I have a brief question. Did you feel as the Lithuanian government uh, support from the European Commission in the issue around Bill Russian nuclear power plant? I don't sure. Maybe it's a mistake? Yeah. I collect questions. Okay. And please, short questions and short answers. Thank you. My question is about Nord Stream. Uh, as far as I know, um, uh, environmental um, concerns, you raised environmental concerns on your side, but the environmental um, uh, approval has been given by Sweden and Finland. And what, what are your concerns uh, if Baltic 2 goes through the same corridor and how can you have an leverage if you can any, have any leverage on this? Um, in my understanding, it's more geopolitical issue rather than environmental, since the uh, environmental approval has been already given to, the, to that pipeline. And my second question is, uh, also goes through uh, to this um, uh, um, nuclear power plant in Belarus. What kind of um, accident have happened uh, on this site? Because it's still in the building process, as far as I know. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the last question for... Uh, one else, please. Yes, uh, the good news is I don't have a question, but a very quick comment. Uh, my name is Patrick Larkin from the Energy Charter Secretariat. And given that this workshop is about addressing energy security risks in the Southern Caucasus, I just want to remind the workshop of the existence of the Energy Charter Treaty. It's a treaty that all the countries of the Southern Caucasus, Georgia, Azerbaijan and Armenia, are contracting parties of. In fact, Georgia was the first country to ratify the treaty. Last year, uh, had the chairmanship, a very successful chairmanship, thanks to Madam uh, Radishvili. But I will be in a panel tomorrow and I will discuss this. But I just want to, to remind you this early stage of the existence of this treaty and its importance for the question of energy security. Thank you. Thank you very much. And please, I want to have the floor for concise replies. Okay. Uh, well, well, first of all, first of all, thank you very much for your questions and, and the ones which are related to the nuclear power plant being constructed in the neighborhood of Lithuania. Uh, well, first of all, uh, about the reaction of the Lithuanian government. So, um, if I understood your question properly, uh, the government was, is, is, is telling very clear thing, actually, that uh, the power plants which are being constructed, uh, well, uh, inside Lithuania, around Lithuania, doesn't matter, but if the electricity is about to be supplied to the European Union, it has to come to the market on a fair, on a fair conditions. And, and we think, basically, when we see the process in Belarus, we see that uh, this power plant is being constructed uh, without uh, respect of uh, certain international agreements. Uh, the ESPO Convention, the Aarhus Convention, and uh, uh, the good neighborhood uh, uh, principles are not being respected in this case. And, and we think that this could also lead to a certain distortion in the market. Uh, if, if some companies, some countries built the same uh, kind of objects uh, following certain rules and others are doing the same without paying full attention to the security and safety matters. So, of course, then to compete in terms of prices will be uh, a little bit unfair thing. So uh, there was uh, uh, really uh, no uh, support and uh, no positive uh, blessings from Lithuanian uh, government with regards to the process of uh, nuclear power plant construction uh, in Ostrovets, uh, where we are always uh, uh, certain uh, uh, worries about this project uh, and, and, and things like that. Uh, what regards the accidents, uh, really you are very much right. Uh, it's, uh, well, as uh, we count uh, more or less about 50, 60 percent of uh, uh, fulfillment of a project yet. So uh, the nuclear reactor, uh, as far as I know, it's still not in the place. But uh, what is uh, already falling, so it's the corpus of a nuclear reactor. And we had this accident in July. We had the certain uh, uh, bad, thing, bad things uh, just happening in the, uh, well, very simple uh, construction works. And then we tell that if this process is uh, not properly managed, uh, then the most complicated parts uh, still didn't arrive. So we simply ask a question, basically, uh, what will happen when the nuclear reactor will have to, will have to be installed? 
So uh, it's more about a reaction to uh, uh, the accidents which are already happening. And we see that these reactions are, are not proper. This is not uh, the neighbors actually inform each other on, uh, on the accidents. And it's not um, the way how actually the serious uh, constructors are dealing with these kind of accidents. On the Nord Stream as well, well, um, you are very much right with the question uh, that maybe it's less about, the, uh, not so much about the environment, but more so because it's uh, uh, the second branch. It's more about the ge geopolitical issues. But when we come to the reaction, actually, so we have to look at uh, the norms so we can, uh, uh, we can involve into the reaction. And uh, the environmental issues, the legal issues, the third energy, with respect to the third energy package and uh, the third party access, basically becomes the instruments uh, we can use in the daily uh, legal discussion. Of course, this is first of all the geopolitical uh, geopolitical project, and, and of course uh, the concerns are the geopolitical ones, but we also see uh, the very clear uh, legal instruments which can be involved in order to uh, rediscuss the issue and, and maybe to bring this kind of project to the attention of uh, bigger member states uh, one more time. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, this was a very rich uh, session and rich uh, panel we had here. I think we don't need a final Q&A session. We, we had uh, plenty of opportunity and I thank the audience for, for active uh, participating in the discussion and for, for excellent questions. Uh, it would be inappropriate if I would now try to sum it up, in particular as we are a bit late. But just to say, I mean, we had a, a great uh, presentation from the minister uh, regarding the, the Georgian case and, and the example here in Georgia. Bill gave us an excellent overview about the global situation uh, when it comes to, to energy, gas, oil. And then Gulmira gave us the Azeri case, but not only the Azeri case, you addressed also the regions where Azeri gas flows, so it was more than a regional, it was also a kind of a global outlook. And then finally, Arunas with, with a great overview about the situation in, in the Baltics, which is uh, one example how, how you can uh, create energy efficiency and diversification. So thanks to all of you, I think excellent panel, and the goal uh, to look at the landscape for energy security has been fully achieved.